how exchange makes us uh, uh, competitive. Um, let me, um, as, as, the, as the presenter uh, discussed, I am um, uh, the chief economic advisor to the World Economic Forum. At the World Economic Forum, we uh, evaluate competitiveness uh, for all the countries in the world. We publish the report on competitiveness and there are fractions of the report that have to do with, uh, with uh, trade. So let me, let me emphasize, uh, emphasize uh, those. Um, um, could, could you put the, my presentation on the screen? Because I, I see myself there. There's no need to see myself. Thank you. Um, now, uh, the, the human, uh, human uh, species is the only one that uh, exchanges voluntarily goods for other goods. As, as uh, um, uh, Adam Smith uh, famously put it, no one has ever seen a dog voluntarily exchanging a bone for another bone with another dog. Um, why are we uh, such a, you know, such a, a strange uh, species? Um, well, uh, it turns out that about 70,000 years ago, there was what we call the cognitive revolution. Um, we went from, uh, you know, pre-humans to humans, and with humanity, we developed the skills to understand mm, strange concepts, str concepts that are strange to animals, such as um, I'll, you know, I'll give you uh, six bananas if you give me a massage. Or uh, if you give me six bananas, I will uh, give you uh, seven bananas in a year. Or if you give me six bananas, I will uh, help you uh, in the afterlife. Or I will protect you against, uh, against the foreign invaders. And, um, and, and with the develop development of these uh, cognitive skills, of course, uh, uh, trade was born, uh, credit was born, religion was born, or the state was, was born. And all of these had uh, tremendous uh, implications uh, for human beings. Let me talk about the first one. I'm not going to talk about the state or religion, uh, but I will talk about trade, the importance of trade. Why is exchange uh, so good for humanity? Well, obviously, we all know, because we, we, when went to college, we were told over and over again the Ricardo story. Uh, trade is good because imagine that there are two people, uh, a man and a woman, and a woman takes about two hours to collect roots, and it takes three hours to collect, uh, to, to hunt uh, for meat, uh, and a man takes uh, 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 five and four. Now, if uh, everyone works separately, woman would take five hours to get both the roots and the meat, and men would take about nine hours. Now, if they come up with the idea, why don't we specialize? Why don't woman uh, you know, collect all the roots and men does all the hunting? Uh, and they do it for both. So women would take twice two hours to collect the roots. Men take twice four hours to collect uh, to to hunt. Notice that uh, if they uh, uh, they uh, hunt and they collect roots for each other and they trade, notice that they both saved an hour. Okay, they both saved an hour, saving an hour, doing the same thing with less time. That's the key concept: gaining productivity doing the same thing with less time or doing more with the same time. Now things get even better if we, we realize that when we specialize, we learn. We get good at doing roots, we get good at hunting. And therefore, instead of two hours, it takes one, and instead of four hours, it takes three. So now, uh, notice that if we do exchange, we now save two hours. And these two extra hours can be used to uh, continue to produce roots and to continue to produce um, uh, um, uh, hunting and uh, use the remaining of the roots and the remaining of the meat to hire somebody uh, that provides uh, shoes or provides uh, clothing or provides religious services or provides uh, protection uh, and that's how uh, religion is born and how the state is born uh, because we are able to, um, to, to, to feed these people that are not the really directly uh, producing uh, food. Now this is the, uh, what, equipped with these um, 
cognitive uh, skills, uh, humans uh, left uh, Africa uh, in uh, about 100,000 years ago and they traveled all the way to India and they traveled uh, down to Australia and they invented the needle so they could get clothing. Uh, remember this was the Ice Age, uh, so they walked through the ice uh, to the north uh, where they found the Neanderthals in Europe and they killed them and then they crossed over uh, uh, through the, the Bering Strait. It was ice back then so you could walk all the way to Americas and from North America they walked down to South America and that's how we humans colonized the world. We had a superior uh, mind, uh, a superior mind to all other uh, human uh, species. But then the Ice Age uh, came to an end and the water rose, uh, uh, the water rose and uh, uh, and the various um, and, and the various groups uh, got isolated. Okay, the Eurasians got isolated from the Americans. The Americans were isolated from the Australians. The Australians from the Tasmanians, and uh, so on and so forth. Now each group uh, continued to specialize within the family, specialize within groups, um, um, and they uh, traded with each other. Uh, the the hunters and gatherers met once a year in certain places to trade goods um, and. And um, um, soon uh, they developed uh, means to exchange, like credit, like money, things that made uh, exchange much easier. Uh, then they invented agriculture. They settled in villages and, and cities. And when they settled uh, in villages and cities, then it was much easier to find each other and continue to trade. And uh, great civilization started to uh, grow uh, initially in Mesopotamia and Egypt and India followed by uh, China and uh, then uh, the Mediterranean. And then these different civilizations wanted to trade with each other. And they developed a, a Silk Road uh, where, uh, uh, you know, where uh, people travel uh, by foot or by camel, you know, from city to city. Cities were developed all around uh, the Silk Road. and. Um, uh, and um, uh, you know, after traveling uh, through, uh, you know, th for many many years through, uh, you know, by, by foot, uh, they developed um, uh, trade uh, uh, by boat. Uh, the Chinese uh, <coughs> uh, uh, Almiran Almiran He uh, in China had a bo had a, a fleet of 30,000 30, boats where uh, they were used to uh, trade with all the cities along the coast. And the more they traded, the more uh, the richer they got, the more civilization uh, evolved. Um, um, and then um, uh, one of these guys that walked through the uh, walked through the Silk Road was a European guy called Marco Polo, who discovered a great world, a much more advanced world than Europe, with uh, you know uh, fireworks and paper money and advanced agriculture. And he went back to Europe and explained how how advanced uh, China was. Uh, but then China collapsed. Um, you know the great China of the 13th, 14th century, the most advanced country in the world was the least advanced country uh, in the 20th century, one of the poorest countries in the world. Why did China collapse? Well, it turns out that the bureaucracy of the Ming dynasty essentially destroyed the boats of Almiran He, uh, destroyed trade, and with the destruction of trade, the destruction of culture, the destruction of, uh, of uh, civilization. Um, um, and then, um, uh, in the middle of all these, uh, the Ottoman Empire uh, invaded, uh, invaded Constantinople and uh, they cut the Silk Road in two. Europeans could not trade with, uh, with the Asians. Uh, um, the the, the uh, spices that Europeans wanted, the silk that Europeans want, no longer could be found in Europe. And of course, Europeans tried to go around the world to find these desired spices. And that's how Christopher Columbus had the idea that uh, the world was round and if you could travel around the world, he could actually reach uh, India. He thought the world was 7,000 miles uh, long. Uh, he was a big mistake. He was much, much longer. Luckily for him, he found the continent in the middle. Uh, he landed in the Bahamas and new trade posts were developed. The Spaniards, the uh, English, uh, the, the Dutch uh, started trading with all these new places and the more trade, the more, uh, the more uh, 
uh, advanced the, the economy became. And this is the kind, this is one of the kinds of things that we try to, 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 to capture at the World Economic Forum. There are, uh, you know, trade uh, makes you rich, uh, trade makes you prosper, trade, you, trade makes you competitive because it allows for specialization. But uh, if you notice, uh, if you notice what happened in 1492, is that when the Europeans uh, landed in in uh, America, uh, their their technology was much more advanced. They had guns, they had uh, cannons, uh, they had steel helmets. You know, the the Indians. You know, Columbus thought that he was in India, and actually he died, and he didn't even know when he died that he had discovered a new continent. Uh, uh, but the, the, the so-called Indians were half naked. They didn't have any technology. They were you know, backwards relative to Europeans. And that uh, has to let us, uh, you know, this has to make us think. Now, when we invaded, the, when the human, when sapien, Homo sapiens invaded the entire world, uh, and the Ice Age ended, so all the sea levels rose, uh, various groups were isolated for 10,000 years. Okay, uh, the Eurasians talk to each other. As I explained, the Silk Road travel, right? They talk to Europeans, Asians, Africans talk to each other, but they never talk to Americans. The Americans talk to each other from north to south, they travel, but they didn't talk to anybody else. Australians didn't talk to each other, okay? So when we rediscovered each other, notice that the places that had more people had a much more advanced technology. Right? The most advanced place in the world in 1492 was Eurasia, right? Europe, Asia, Africa, this continent, where through the years, uh, you know, we talk to each other. Uh, notice that uh, agriculture, for example, was invented in uh, somewhere in between the Tigris and the Euphrates. Uh, and a few hundred years later, it was known all over the world. It was known in China, it was known in Europe, everywhere had agriculture. You don't have to invent agriculture one over again, right? Once you see somebody doing agriculture, then you copy. Somebody invented the wheel, and then a few hundreds or thousands years later, everybody had the wheel. You saw it and you copied it, okay? Uh, but in order to see it, you had to be in touch with these people. Of course, Americans were not in touch with these people, so they didn't have many of the advanced technologies that Eurasians had. So the more people, more ideas, more knowledge, uh, um, uh, fewer people, fewer ideas, fewer knowledge. Um, even there are the, 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 so the most advanced society in the world was uh, Eurasia, followed by the Americans, followed by Australia, followed by the Little Islands, the Pacific. The smaller the area, the more isolated the area, the more technologically backward. Okay. Even in Tasmania, uh, an island that was uh, that was linked to Australia uh, 10,000 years ago during the Ice Age became isolated, and the technology of uh, the Tasmanians in 1492 was more backwards than they had been 10,000 years earlier. If you don't have enough people to trade with, to exchange with, your technology goes backwards. We forget stuff, right? Think about what would happen if we got isolated in this room. Right? How many things would we be able to produce 10,000 years from now, things that we have today? How many of those things we will still know how to do 10,000 years later? If we were just the people in this room, probably we would forget almost everything. If you don't exchange ideas, your technology goes, uh, goes uh, uh, backward. Which brings us to the second key, uh, uh, the second key point um, of the... Uh, of, uh, the second biggest point of, uh, of uh, economic uh, uh, thought uh, through history. The first one was Adam Smith, 1776. Exchange leads to specialization and to productivity. And that is true. But this doesn't explain why these, you know, there was these big differences in technology in 1492. Which brings us to the second key point, the economics of ideas. The key, besides specialization, the key to competitiveness is ideas. Okay, now think about what would happen if you take your iPhone, I don't recommend you doing this, but if you take your iPhone and you put it in a blender, okay, and you blow it up, you will, you will get powder, okay? In fact, of the 137 grams that your iPhone weighs, you will get about 27 grams of plastic, 20 grams of glass, 14 grams of aluminum, uh, 30 grams of lithium, mainly from the battery, uh, 15 uh, grams of chrome. The cost of all of these materials, if you try to sell all this powder, you will get about 15 cents. 
Okay. Now you can add uh, uh, labor, of course, to put together all of these materials into something that is useful for making phone calls. Uh, you will get about five minutes of labor. I don't know how much the people producing iPhones uh, get, but five minutes of labor is not a lot of money. Do you know how much of an iPhone costs? Eight hundred and forty-nine dollars. The majority of the value of the iPhone, the majority of the value of most products today is not the materials, is not even the labor. It's the ideas they embody. An iPhone has thousands of different ideas. The idea of plastic, the idea of transistors, the idea of microchips, the idea of cellular technology, the idea of uh, digital cameras. Thousands and thousands of ideas embodied in one little box. And those ideas is what really has value, okay? Um, which, of course, uh, everybody understands it. That's why most government officials around the world worry about uh, ideas. They worry about innovation, and that's why we at the World Economic Forum, we also try to include innovation in our measures of competitiveness. Um, but we need to be careful not to confuse innovation with research and development. Many people, especially in the academic community, also in the political community, make the mistake of thinking they are the same, and they're not. Okay? If they were the same, if they were the same, uh, you wouldn't wear an iPhone in your pocket, right? If R&D was the same as innovation, your, uh, in your pocket, the device you would wear in your pocket would be called Nokia. Nokia, uh, about 10 years ago, Nokia uh, was the leading company. In fact, 10 years ago, if I had this conference 10 years ago, most of us would have had a Nokia in our pockets. Um, and uh, Nokia was not only the leading company uh, in cellular technology, it was also the leading company in R&D spending. It was the company that is spending most money in R&D in the entire world. And all that R&D, led to tons and tons, thousands and thousands of patents. And all of these patents led to bankruptcy. In the uh, year 2000, Nokia's shares were about $56 a share. As you know, Nokia went bankrupt and was purchased by Microsoft uh, two years ago for $3 a share. Okay, now uh, Nokia is uh, all, but, all but gone. Uh, R&D didn't help Nokia. Now, why didn't R&D help Nokia? Well, uh, um, help me um, uh, in identifying what do you see uh, in common? Uh, uh, what do all of these uh, pictures uh, have in common? Starbucks, Steve du Soleil, Zara, Ikea, Facebook. What do they have in common? Well, obviously, obviously, they are great ideas, right? Great business innovations, right? Uh, there's no denying that all of these are great business innovations in the sense that they, uh, they uh, make billions of dollars in uh, profits altogether. They hire uh, millions of people. Uh, you know, everybody uses, many, many people use all of these ideas. Great business innovations. Second thing they have in common, they all are innovations in very traditional sectors. Sectors. The Romans had circus 2,000 years ago. Uh, the cavemen had furniture. And 2,000 years ago, we had circus, and uh, Cirque du Soleil innovates 2,000 years later. The cavemen had, uh, had uh, furniture 10, 15,000 years ago in their caves. And today, we have innovation in furniture. Uh, the needle was invented 40,000 years ago. Clothes were invented 40,000 years ago. Ah, 40,000 years later, we innovate in clothing, Zara. Very, very, very traditional sectors also innovate. People tend to confuse our uh, uh, innovation with new technologies, right? As if only uh, pharmaceutical companies could innovate, as if only uh, telecommunications could uh, innovate. No, everybody can innovate, everybody has to innovate, even the most traditional uh, sectors. But the key point of all of, these, all of these pictures is that none of these inventors, none of these people who had great ideas was a scientist. None of these ideas came from R&D. Okay, uh, Guy La Liberté from Cirque du Soleil was a street performer. Uh, the inventors of Starbucks was an were an English teacher, a history teacher, and a poet. Uh, the creator of uh, Zara, um, of IKEA, was a student. 
um, Amancio Ortega of Zara was a worker. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, of course, as you know, is a student. None of them was a scientist. None of these ideas came from R&D. And you might say, well, you just speak the right uh, businesses so I could get it, so I could be correct. But in fact, uh, we have economic research that shows that 92, it's a wonderful book by Amar Bide uh, with a title uh, similar that reminds us of, uh, of uh, Charles Darwin's book on the, uh, on the origin and evolution, not of species, but of businesses, 72% of business ideas, 72% of business ideas come from workers. 20% come from regular people that are not scientists. The student, the street performer, the teacher, the football player, and so on and so forth. Regular people. Only 8% of business ideas come from R&D. Okay? Um, and this has profound implications when we think about how to measure the contribution of innovation to competitiveness, okay? We shouldn't just put patents, as most people do. Uh, we shouldn't just put uh, R&D effort. We should try to capture these innovations by regular people and how countries help try to change and try to induce regular people 20% of regular people, 72% workers, uh, to come up with ideas. Um, and that's, what who, that's how we are trying to change, that this is the 10th year anniversary of the index that uh, I created for the forum, uh, uh, and we are going to change a few things. Let me tell you what we are going to change next year. In 2016, the index will change slightly along the following lines. Uh, first thing we're gonna change is the way we view human capital. Education is, uh, if the countries that will get more weight are countries that have education for all, universal education. Why? Why education for all is important? Well, if you thought, if you thought that ideas came from scientists, that the good education system would be a system where you pick the best kids, you put them in super schools for superstar kids, you teach them how to do research, you send them to, you know, to create ideas, to the research and development, and in the rest of the kids you just send, you know, relax at Atlantis for the rest of the year because the ideas come from the super kids and, you know, the rest of us just uh, wait for them to come up with ideas, okay? But that's not how ideas are created. I uh, said ideas come from regular people and therefore what we need is re for regular people for students street performers workers to come up with ideas you need those people to be uh, creative universal education second uh, schools need to understand the world okay uh, if you look at the picture of a school in almost every country you pick the country you come from, picture a school in your country, it's gonna look like this okay if you took a picture uh, of a school 300 years ago it would be exactly the same, okay? Same chairs, same uh, tables, same board, and in some classrooms, even the same teacher, okay? Um, now, um, but the world has changed. The world has changed in dramatic ways, okay? Have you, have you seen children with iPhones, right? You don't need to teach them. It's like, you know, they're born, and they know how to use the iPhone. It's like if they were practicing in the, their mother's wounds, if, as, if, as if they were intrauterine iPhones uh, for them to practice, they're born with it. They're born with the technology, okay? And this changes dramatically some of the fundamental pillars that drive the education system. The most fundamental pillar of the education system is that the teacher knows more than the student, right? Well. When it comes to technology, that's not true, right? Picture what would happen in any classroom in your country, what would happen uh, if all of a sudden the computer breaks? Who is the least qualified person to solve the problem? The teacher. Everybody knows this is the teacher. The students know is the teacher. So the students think, if this guy doesn't know something as important as computers, necessarily what he's teaching me is useless. And that's why they lose the intellectual respect for the teachers, right? The world has changed, the school system hasn't. The school system has to understand that. Um, third, we need to teach to question. The regular school system, essentially, the teacher preaches, the teacher tells the student, the students memorize, uh, the, the, and then the, the test is that the teacher asks the question and the student responds. 
When the students ask too many questions, the parents receive a letter from the teacher saying, ask the kid to shut up because he's, he was holding back the class, right? But if you don't ask questions, you cannot have ideas, right? Ideas are a combination of a question and an answer. Before you answer something, you need to realize something is broken, something doesn't work, something is needed but it doesn't exist, right? You need to question something. And then the answer is the idea. Without questions, there's no ideas, okay? Now, we don't teach uh, kids to learn, yet idea, I mean, uh, questioning is crucial. I had the luxury of meeting uh, Amancio Ortega, the creator of Zara, and I asked him, um, uh, because I'm writing a book on innovation, I asked him, what, you know, you know you're one of the great innovators of the 20th century? And he said, no, 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 no. I only, the only thing I do is I ask. And I ask two questions. First, I ask why. I want to understand what we're doing. I want to understand the world. And second, I ask, why not? Which brings me to new worlds, okay? Um, and that's what he did. Since we invented the, the needle uh, 20,000, uh, 40,000 years ago, until 1920, essentially everybody made their own clothes. And then in 1920, the world changed. Christian Dior invented Pret-a-Porter. Pret-a-Porter changed the way we do business in the clothing industry. A guru, usually a French person with an incredibly good taste, designs the clothes for us. And then the designs are sent to the poorest possible countries where uh, the, the, the lowest paid workers are, are, are asked to produce millions of these units, which are then sent to the rest of the world and they're sold in Fifth Avenue for extravagant prices. That's how the fashion industry works. Works, and we do this twice a year, in the summer and in the winter, okay? And Amancio Ortega asked, why? Why do we do it twice a year? Why don't we do it every week? Why can't we do it every week? Nobody could answer. Well, because Christian Dior said that we should do it twice, and that's how we do it. And because he didn't get an answer, he asked, why don't we do it uh, every week? And he created a new fashion every week, a new fashion every week. And instead of producing millions of units, we produce very few units. And this led to the notion people go to Zara very, very often because things change constantly. You go to H&M, every time is the same. For six months, it's the same thing. So you go to H&M twice a year. In fact, the average customer of H&M goes to H&M three times a year. The average customer at Zara goes 17 times a year. And because they know that things are going to be gone, because there are a few units, when you go, you buy. So people go to the store more often, they buy more often, and that's how they did business. And that's how he became the third richest man in the world, okay? He would be the second had not he divorced, um, <laughs> which, is another gr which is another innovation, okay? Uh, we need to teach, we need to teach kids to ask questions. We need to allow kids to ask questions. We need to change the education system in this regard. We need to teach, we need to teach observation. Are you observant? Are you an observant person? Well, um, the inventor, the creator of, uh, of uh, IKEA, uh, he had a regular uh, uh, furniture business, regular furniture business, and then he hired a, a photographer to do a marketing uh, campaign for him, and the photographer said we should put some tables back, you know, next to the trees, and he tried to put the tables uh, in the car to take them to the trees to take pictures, and he couldn't, so he disassembled the, disassembled the legs. And Krampat, the owner of IKEA, saw that, he observed, and said, what a great idea. And from that moment on, he decided to design all of his furniture disassembled, right? A, 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 a furniture that could be assembled by the customer, assembled that could be stored in the, in the, in the factory, uh, so that uh, you know, when people buy, uh, buy um, uh, furniture, they can take it home the same day, and they can build it the same day. This way, they shift the cost to the customer, and they shift the transportation cost to the customer, and uh, the, the, the storage costs go down, and so on and so forth. That's how he created IKEA, the new IKEA. He observed, he saw, he paid attention. Now, are you observant? If I drew, if I drew these two circles, could you draw a bicycle? I will not have time to do it, uh, but I guarantee that if I asked you to draw a bicycle, 90% of you would draw a straight line from one of the wheels to the other wheel, which is the other, which is the only way for this bicycle not to work, right? Notice if it has an axis from one, from one wheel to the other, the, top, the front wheel is not going to be able to, to turn around, right? Uh, the, all the bicycles always have the first wheel independent of the other wheel, okay? Um, now, why can't people draw bicycles? 
Have you ever seen a bicycle, by the way? You've seen bicycles, right? If you see bicycles, you've seen thousands of bicycles. How come you cannot, how come, how come you can't draw a bicycle if you have seen thousands of them? You never paid attention. You've never been taught to pay attention. And if you don't pay attention, business opportunities go, will go by it in front of you and you will miss them. Okay? Uh, one way to pay attention is to draw the bicycle. Once you draw it once, you will be able to draw it forever. Okay? Which means that in the school system, art is way more important than a lot of other uh, activities. Yet art is usually the worst, the, the least important of, of the activities. That also we need to evaluate, that we need to change. We need to learn how to connect ideas. Ideas are usually the connection of other ideas. Okay, as I said, the iPhone is the combination of thousands of ideas, idea of plastic, the idea of microchips, the idea of cellular uh, technology, and so on and so forth. Uh, do you know why Google is so good? So Google, Google is not the first search engine. There were search, there were search engines before Google, many of them, remember? It was a terrible world, right? The world of Excite, the world of Lycos, the world of Yahoo. You would look for a word and you never found what you were looking for and then you tried to put some other words and you never found. It was a very complicated enterprise. You had to be really good at searching, okay? Now, remember the first feeling you had when you found Google? You type your word and boom! As if by magic, what you're looking for appears at the top. How do they know? How do they know what you're looking for? Okay, well, it turns out that the key is not the search, the key is the ordering. How do you order? And how do you order? Well, it turns out that both Larry Page and Sergey Brin, the two founders of Google, are sons of university professors. And university professors are ranked, the way I am ranked is uh, through citations. If the lots of papers cite me, a lot of research cites me, I go up the ranks. But not all of the citations are worth the same. If my brother cites me, it doesn't count. If an important person with lots of citations cites me, then I get, I get a lot of weight, okay? And that's exactly what the idea they had. Why don't we bring that ranking to the search engine? If a website has lots of links, that means that it's a very important website. It, therefore, it is likely that what we're looking for is that website. And, but the links are not all import, uh, equally important. If, uh, if, uh, if, you, if you are linked to a place that has lots of links, that means it's not your brother. Uh, that means that well, that website is important. It will move up the rankings. And that's how uh, Google became so important, because it was a combination of two ideas, search and citations. Um, and that's how, again, they became one of the richest uh, uh, companies in the world. Association of ideas. Now, this means that we need to teach, uh, we need to learn how to associate, we need to um, uh, teach our students multidisciplinary, uh, multidisciplinary activities. Uh, we notice that we do the opposite. We tend to hyper-specialize from a very young age. At a very young age, you have to decide whether you're going to be a scientist or a poet. Uh, and at age 14, kids don't know anything. Uh, ultra specialization might be good, uh, but it's a, it's a bad thing because the people don't um, don't um, uh, are unable to uh, to connect. Uh, six, uh, it is very important to act. Once you have an idea, you need to implement it. Having ideas like uh, like Nokia, Nokia had tons and tons of patents. They never implemented. They could have had the iPhone. If you look at the patent book of iPhone of of, of, of uh, Nokia, they actually had all the patents they needed to create the iPhone. They never created the iPhone. They never implemented. They didn't want to kill their own business, uh, and that is a big mistake. See, in 1979, a young young kid from California uh, had you know, created a computer business. Uh, 1979 was a, was a world, remember, where uh, computers had, you know, black screens and you could only see green letters, right? And you would type in letters and numbers and letters and numbers. Uh, and this guy visits PARC, the Palo Alto Research Center, um, a research center by uh, Xerox, where he found this machine. This machine was attached to a computer. When you moved this machine, an arrow moved in the screen of the computer. Okay, and you click this uh, this uh, machine, and you could click uh, the arrow. You would click in the in the in the, the screen, and you could move things around the screen. It was magic. It was magic. Uh, this box cost about three hundred dollars. It was uh, you know complex mechanism of wheels underneath, um, and this guy left the uh, park immediately. Went to 
to the pharmacy where he uh, where he bought all kinds of deodorant okay uh, because he thought that the roll uh, the, the the roll on part of the of the deodorant was uh, something that you could put inside this box to make it roll uh, because he knew that if you could create this box for fifteen dollars uh, that would be the revolution this guy was of course uh, Steve Jobs uh, and that's how he, he created uh, uh, the first Mac the first Macintosh okay um, he uh, paid attention but not only paid attention, he implemented, he quickly did it, okay? Of course, uh, he also invented this thing. You know what this thing is? A Newton. Do you know what the Newton is? Of course, nobody knows what the Newton is because it was a big fiasco, okay? That was one of the great ideas of uh, Apple, big fiasco. But Apple, uh, after the fiasco, it was a PDA that was never successful. After this fiasco, they reinvented the whole thing and they created the iPhone. He tried, he failed, he tried again, he succeeded. Uh, other companies never tried. Kodak, you know Kodak that no longer exists? Kodak is bankrupt, okay? It was the, one of the largest companies in the world. They thrived in the world of photography and film and uh, they went bankrupt. You know why they went bankrupt? Of course, because of digital technology, digital, digital uh, photography. You know who invented digital photography? Kodak. <laughs> they invented digital photography. And because they wanted to keep the business, their old business, the film business, they decided not to pursue that avenue. Of course, the Japanese didn't listen. They developed the, the, the digital technology that ended up killing Kodak. Right? You have the idea, you don't implement it, you die. Not implementing, not going through with your idea sometimes is worse than, than, uh, than uh, failing, than trying, failing, and trying again that Steve Jobs did. Nespresso. You know Nespresso, you know, the very fashionable coffee things. Uh, in 2005, they hired George Clooney. Now everybody is using an Nespresso because it's a sophisticated upper class coffee thing. Okay? But uh, it was invented in 1976. In 1976, for 30 years, ne ne Nestle had the Nespresso. And they never, they never implemented it. You know why they never implemented it? Because the high executives of Nestle tried to prevent it. They had a coffee business, right? The instant coffee, Nescafe. And the high executives, the vice president, they say, no, 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 we don't want the capsule business. It's going to kill our own business. Get it out of here. Luckily, one of the workers decided to keep it. And he asked the president, can I do it? I, I know I can do it. And in order to protect this idea from the company itself, they created a separate company called Nespresso. Nespresso is not uh, Nestle, it's a different company. And, uh, now, uh, and, and now it's one of the most important, uh, most, most important co companies uh, in the world. And finally, seven, interaction. When you ask people, we ask, uh, you know, scientists ask people, how, where do ideas take place? You know what, what ideas, business ideas, where do they take place? In the CEO room? In the, in the, in the innovation department? The answer is when you ask companies where did physically in the company did idea take place, the answer normally is in the water cooler. The water cooler is where people talk and exchange ideas. Interaction, exchanging ideas is the key. Which brings us back to the time where we split, humans split into different groups that never talked to each other for 10,000 years. And the places where people had trade, had traded for thousands of years, ended up being the most developed. Okay? Um, these, the reason why they ended up being most developed is that when you trade, you change ideas. And when you change ideas, everybody benefits. And the benefits of exchanging ideas are much greater than what Adam Smith said. So if you exchange cookies, you have two persons, one has Oreo cookies, one has fortune cookies, and they exchange. Before the exchange, every person has two cookies, right? And they exchange, how many cookies each person has? Two. We still have two, right? But imagine that instead of changing cookies, we change the recipes for cookies. 
Before we start, every person has two recipes. Everybody knows how to make wine, and uh, the left person knows how to make cook uh, Oreos, the right, person, the right person knows how to make fortune cookies. Do you agree with me that everybody, two persons have two ideas each? Now imagine they teach each other, they exchange the idea, not the cookies, the idea. Notice that because the same idea, once you exchange the idea, you can still use the, or the, the idea, right? Uh, because ideas are non-rival. Notice that now everybody has three ideas. You exchange ideas, everybody has more. And therefore, the more people we have, the more people we trade with, the more ideas we all have. That's why when we rediscovered America, the richest part of the world was the part that had the most exchange. The more people, the more exchange, okay? Um, and why is that? Well, after the cognitive revolution that I talked about in the beginning, um, humans invented writing, and with writing, notice that we could take our knowledge outside of our brains. The pre-humans, everything they knew, they had to be in their brains. With, uh, uh, with um, uh, writing, we took our knowledge and we put it in books, and then we put it in computers. And now, what we know is more than anybody knows. Ask yourself, who knows how to make an iPhone? The answer is nobody. Nobody knows how to make an iPhone. The CEO of Apple doesn't know how to make an iPhone. He knows how to run a big company. He knows finance and stuff, but he doesn't know how to make plastic. He doesn't know how to make a microchip. The people who know how to make plastic don't know how to make microchips. The people who know microchips don't know how to make plastic. Nobody knows. But the human race as a whole has a collective brain that is outside each individual brain. And all of a sudden, each of us is a part of this collective brain. And how do these different parts of the brain interact? Well, they interact through trade, okay? And that is the second key reason why trade is so important. The first one is Adam Smith's division of labor. The second and way more important than that is it brings knowledge. Thank you very much.